Jersey. We advertise for Grove City College. And have for a long time. Kath and I are voices. Our children have attended Grove City College. We love the school. Recently, Grove City College has fallen into a, a, a bit of a quagmire. It has been uh, attacked. And um, because uh, Grove City is a conservative evangelical school. And because it's trying like every Christian, either church, school, organization, trying to navigate the rules of cultural engagement that quickly change. Quickly change. Yep. And a lot of us trip up. A lot of us um, are injurious in our speech or are appear disloyal to our um, core group or tribe. Um, I think, at least as someone who's in the media, I find it to be an extremely challenging landscape Can on a imagine? daily basis. Right. The idea of wokeness, right? We've heard this phrase, wokeness. What is wokeness and what does it look like and when is, it comes to a college? And is it bad? Is it good? Dr. Carl Truman is with us. Dr. Carl Truman joins us from the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies at Grove City College, where he teaches courses on the history of religious thought. He is the author of the new book, Strange New World, How Thinkers and Activists Redefined Identity and Sparked the Sexual Revolution. Carl, welcome back to the show. Great to be back. Thanks for having me on. Carl, Grove City uh, markets itself as being both conservative and evangelical. Um, Is it still both things? I would say so, yes. I mean, I think the, part of the problem of, in the question, of course, is that the terms conservative and evangelical have themselves become very, very elastic yes. sure. over the last 10, 15, 20 years. So one would have to drill down and say, you know, exactly what do you mean or what do you expect when you say conservative or evangelical? But I think within within the broad understanding of those terms, yes, Grove City is, is firmly is firmly there. That's not to say that every one of my faculty colleagues and I agree on on everything, but it is to say that the college pitches itself, and I think successfully so, uh, within that broad, conservative, evangelical kind of framework. Yes. I would imagine a student who uh, would attend a state uh, university and would come to Grove City as a new student would be shocked by conservative and evangelical life on Grove City. I mean, clearly, it's very defined what happens or does not happen at Grove City College. So, uh, Carl, talk about the idea of where Grove City has found itself, because, you know, on campus, the, the university has been teaching and preaching this way for many, many years. But in this new landscape, as Kath and I said as you were coming in, Grove City has been attacked, I would say, primarily from outside forces who are not part of the regular... Um, Daily expression. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to characterize all of those attacking uh, the college or criticizing the college. I think there are parents and an alumni, perhaps on both sides of the question, with with legitimate concerns uh, about things they're hearing. Um, I would say that, that the college as a whole still retains uh, a very conservative and, and evangelical ethos. I think the problem today in the Internet world is you get sound bikes thrown out there, you get uh, glimpses of what's going on, you don't get to see the whole picture. And both of my sons went to what you might describe as mainline schools. I had one son at the University of Pennsylvania, one son went to Georgetown uh, in Washington, D.C., now, those campuses are very interesting. Yes. Anybody who sort of thinks that Grove is away with the fairies or has gone radically yeah. woke needs to spend. My youngest son said to me recently, looking at some of the things being written online, he said, Dad, these people need to spend 30 seconds on campus at George. Right. Exactly, yes. To yeah. realize what's really going on in the world. Carl, I'm so glad. Having that, go ahead. Say, well, must always be vigilant because we know that, that Christian liberal arts colleges, some of them have drifted very far from their original vision. 100%. And I think some of what's gone on at the moment is is an attempt to reflect on that and ask, are we doing that? And I think the, the key thing there is the matter of self-reflection and and being proactive in terms of dealing with, with any missteps or mistakes that may or may not have been made. Carl, uh, I am a product of public education from the time I was in kindergarten. I never, I never went to a private school. And um, so I find myself... Um, impatient 
with uh, what I and and again we all see through our own filter. Um, but whenever I see a sense of people being afraid of ideas or afraid of books or afraid of that professor or that faculty member, I, I just, Carl, I just, it rankles me because I just feel like our job as Christian adults is to raise up Christian adults. And part of that passage of going from childhood to an adult who believes in Jesus and sees the world is that there are many ideas out there. And so teaching an idea doesn't mean advocacy of the idea. So I know we've talked about this before, but um, give me your take on that as a full-time educator. Yeah, I think you raise a very important point there, Kathy. I used to teach at a seminary, and, and in one of the rooms at the seminary, there was a painting of one of the founding uh, fathers of the seminary. I think Robert Dick Wilson was his name. And underneath the painting, there was a statement, uh, I have not shirked the difficult questions. Mm. And Wilson was an Old Testament scholar, and the point was, even though he was conservative, he'd not been afraid to engage the contemporary questions, challenges in his discipline. And I've always thought that that was a good motto for educators in general. I think there's some very difficult questions, particularly being raised by the wider culture. There are questions that our students are not going to be able to avoid when they leave. I had a young girl in my office the other day asking, how do I deal with the challenge of preferred pronouns in the workplace that I've, I've signed up to go to when I leave the college? There are very, very difficult questions on race, gender, and other things. And the college has to address these. We have to be able to face the most difficult questions in a Christian, thoughtful, conservative way. And in a way, I think that that deals with the questions fairly, that doesn't demonize those asking the questions at the outset. There's another side to that, of course, and that is we have to address these things in a Christian way that we are a Christian liberal arts college, and therefore it can't be a free-for-all. I can't stand up in class, for example, and advocate for pornography. Mm -hmm. That would not be an appropriate thing for a professor at a Christian liberal arts college to do. But I have to be able to help my students think about issues raised by, say, pornography in a way that's going to help them think Christianly about this and realize why it's evil, why it's wrong, why some of their friends may disagree with them and why their friends should be challenged on that. So I think we should not shirk the difficult questions. The key is approaching those difficult questions, not in a knee-jerk, we're not going to even talk about them, but in a way that addresses them from a Christian perspective. Yes. So, Carl, just as the words conservatism or evangelicalism have elasticity in their meanings, so too does the word woke. And, of course, that could, you know, mean a lot of different things to every uh, individual person. So, you know, the idea of being charged with wokeness at Grove City College, I'm not even quite sure what that would mean. Can you go into that? I mean, is wokeness in Inherently, whatever that definition may be, primarily, is it a bad thing? Does it have a place in a conservative college? Again, it depends what you mean by it. I yes. think part of the problem with the debate as it's, as it's playing out, not just uh, uh, relative to growth, but in wider society, is that we have buzzwords that are easy to use about the people we want to demonize and dismiss. Mm. So on the one hand, if you can throw the accusation of white privilege at somebody, you can dismiss them. Coming the other way, if you can dismiss, if you can claim that somebody's a cultural Marxist or woke, you can dismiss them as well. I think we need to get out from under talking in terms of cliches and start to look at real ideas and real arguments. It's very hard to do in a world where everything's prosecuted on Twitter in sound bites. Mm-hmm. But I think we need to move beyond the cliches to actually saying, well, yeah, we're going to address race. We're not going to do it in a, in a crazy or mad way. This is how we're going to look at it. We're going to look at the problem this way. And we're going to avoid using simplistic labels to dismiss those with whom we disagree, whichever side of the debate they happen to be on. Dr. Carl Truman is with us. Check out his new book, Strange New World, How Thinkers and Activists Redefined Identity and Sparked the Sexual Revolution. Um, Carl... I, and I know we're three white people talking about this, um, so I, I'm not asking us to go outside of our own perspective, um, but just you know, stating the obvious. We have to be able to talk about racial issues and be able to hear what other people say um, without 
uh, jumping down their throat without having to apologize, whatever it is. Um, and so I'm curious from your perspective on how you, th- and maybe this is too big of a question, but how you think a college can do that well, because we've seen a lot of colleges do it badly. And then there have been, as you said, hundreds of Twitter firestorms about every you know college, church or whatever who've done it poorly. Um, so I guess your general thoughts on that. Yeah, again, race is a very touchy issue. And I'm conscious, of course, as uh, I'm not just white, I'm also an immigrant to the United States. And the racial question is very different here to to the way it works out in the United Kingdom, where I come from. Let me say on on the issue of race, take the debate about critical race theory. I'd want to say to somebody, you know, the problems that I see with critical race theory is not that people are talking about race. It's the critical theory dimension Mm -hmm. of it. And I would say, when we talk about race, we want to talk about race, but we don't want to do it in a way that is hitched to a particular philosophy or a particular view of the world that is designed in its very core to delegitimize certain perspectives that may be brought to bear on that. So I would point to, say, the work of of my friend Monique Dusson uh, at the Center for uh, uh, Biblical Unity, she is an African-American woman. She worked in South Africa among uh, abused women. She's got social justice cred you know, to the nth degree. But she's very critical of critical race theory, yet she's offering a way of approaching the racial issue that I think requires us to listen to the voices uh, of our African-American brothers and sisters, and yet to do so in a way that, that doesn't automatically foreclose the issue simply by the presuppositions that are being brought in at the very start. Amen to that. Dr. Truman, thank you. Always a pleasure for your thoughtfulness to join us here on the air. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Dr. Carl Truman from Grove City College, his brand new book, Strange New World, How Thinkers and Activists Redefined Identity and Sparked the Sexual Revolution. Dr. Carl Truman from Grove City College. 